Welcome to the Church at South Lake Online. We are so thankful that you're joining us today. If you're watching on Facebook, we invite you to share this video with your friends and family by clicking the share button. In just a few moments, we will be joining our worship team as we respond to our amazing God through singing. And then Pastor Brian Hammond will be teaching as we continue our sermon series, The Everyday Church. At the Church at South Lake, we are all about loving God, loving others, and living with purpose. And because of people's generosity, we have been able to witness that vision be accomplished all over our community. Now, if you would like to give, you'll have an opportunity to do so by clicking the link on the screen, or if you're joining us on Facebook, the link in the description. Also, if this is your first or second time, we would love to know that. So please take some time to fill out our online connection card. You can click the button on the screen, or if you're watching on Facebook, by clicking the link in the description. We are again so thankful that you joined us today. Now let's get ready for the Church at South Lake Online. Seek him now, seek him now, the King of Heaven. Son of God, enthroned above, heavy cross upon his shoulders, carry for us, carry for us, seek him now, seek him now, our King surrendered, final word of perfect love, hear his cry, Father forgive him. Spoken for us, spoken for us when he said, when he said it is finished. Oh, our hope has just begun.
for your blood, God. Thank you for your resurrection. Oh, and death, lay your weapons down, sin. Your defeat and now the storm is rolled away. Our God reigns. Hallelujah. Crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns soon. Every knee will bow. The storm is rolled away. Our God reigns. That's right. Death lay your weapons down. Say death lay your weapons down. Sin your defeated now. The storm is rolled away. Our God reigns. Crown him with many crowns. Crown. Who can stop the Lord? Say, 
And who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? Come on. Who can stop the Lord? Sing it over your battles. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Not your situations. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Not sickness. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? everybody. Thanks for joining with us this morning for uh, our worship gathering online. Great that you could be with us. We're continuing our series today talking about the everyday church. And the reason we're talking about the everyday church very simply is because, as we mentioned last week, church is not a place that we gather once a week. It is who we are every day. And so we're looking for, this, uh, for the next several weeks about what this looks like in very practical ways. You know, so much focus right now is being put on all the things that we cannot do, right? I mean, we cannot gather in groups that are over 10 people. We cannot attend school or sporting events or concerts. Uh, We cannot, for a lot of people, go to work. Uh, We we cannot uh, shake hands. We cannot go even certain directions down the aisle at the grocery store anymore, right? Which I was reminded of this week. I was in Publix the other day grabbing a couple of things and not really paying attention, kind of in a hurry, and I'm walking down an aisle and a lady walks by and looks at me and and reminds me, hey, you're going the wrong way. Oh, sorry about that, didn't mean to, but there's a lot of things that we cannot do. There's a lot of talk about the things we cannot do, and the same thing with church. I mean, there's a lot that we cannot do. We cannot meet together on Sundays right now. We we, we, we have had to postpone our, our kids camp in, in June and our student camp this summer as well. A lot of our mission trips are on hold. All this talk about what we can't do. But here's the thing. Today, I want us to focus on what we can do. And specifically what we can do as the church, and maybe even more than that, what we are called to do um, as a result of our, of our place in the kingdom of God. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to grab that, open that up today to the book of Titus chapter 2. We're going to spend some time in this letter written by the Apostle Paul. In a little context of this letter, Paul, the, the Apostle, is writing this letter to a guy named Titus who is an overseer of the church. He's basically a pastor and actually kind of a pastor to multiple churches most likely. And he's writing to him, instructing him, helping him become a, a good leader of those churches. And in the middle of this letter, in Titus chapter 2 is where we're going to pick up. And we're going to focus in on chapter 3 today. But I'm going to read through... Um, this, and we're going to walk our way through some very practical ideas about what it means to be the church every day when it comes to our lives as individual followers of Jesus. But let's start. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Here's what he says. He says, Our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. I want to stop for a minute because it's a very, very important statement to understand all that he's about to say. Paul writes that Jesus redeemed us and purified us. And he did that to make us a people for his possession that are are zealous for good works. Here's what that means. 
Jesus, when he saved us, Jesus did not just save us from something. He actually saved us to something. Yes, he did save us from something. He saved us from our sins and from the condemnation of our sins and all that that meant. But that's not where it stopped. Jesus saved us not only from our sins, but he also saved us to something. And what did he save us to? To be a people that were purified, to be God's own possession, God's people who were, in Paul's words, zealous for good works. Now that word zealous, I, I like to think of it more this way, just that they are eager Zealous means eager, a people eager for good works. And so the point that Paul is making is that in Jesus and our relationship with him, God saves us from our sins. He redeems us. And then he saves us to become his possession, to be a people who are eager for good. And so for the rest of our time this morning, I want to talk about what that means, what it means to be eager for good, the way that God has saved us, the things that God has saved us to. And we're going to talk in very, very practical ways today. Because in chapter 3, Paul gets into some really practical detail about what this looks like. In fact, by the end, I'm going to give you four words. I'm going to summarize everything we're going to read in chapter 3 today into four words I'm going to give you by the end of our time together. So let's start uh, by jumping into chapter 3, verse 1. Here's what he says. He says, Remind the people to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy towards all people. Now think about those statements really, really, really quickly. Um, those of you that know, know me well know, may even know what I'm about to say right here, but he, he talks about this idea that we are to be submissive and obedient to the rulers and authorities that are over us. And think about when he writes this. He's writing this at a time when Rome is ruling most of the known modern world in that day. They are not kind rulers. They are oppressive rulers. They are high, highly taxing the people financially. And he says to the people, hey, be sure when it comes to your rulers, to the authorities, to be submissive and to be obedient and to be ready for every good work and to be courteous towards them. Now, again, as I mentioned, those of you that know me well know that, that there's not a lot of soapbox issues that I have personally, but one of them is this issue right here, and that is how we as Christians react to people who are in authority over us. You know, in, in Paul's day, the people that had authority over the Christians as they gathered, as they were trying to live every day the life of the church, were ruthless people, were difficult rulers to submit yourselves to. You know, our day is quite different than that. You know, we live in a free country where there, there's a lot of freedoms that we enjoy, a lot of blessings that we enjoy. And yes, it's a unique season that we are in right now, but it, 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 it's always so surprising to me when you look at the way people react to and speak of people in authority over us, especially our government and elected officials. In the world, it's not really surprising that the world will treat each other with contempt and anger and divisiveness and, and speak ill of one another. What bothers me quite often is when you see Christians speaking about our leaders the exact same way. And here's what's unique about our country. We live in a country where you are not only allowed but encouraged to try to elect into office the people that you think ought to be in, in office or to unelect people out of office that you don't think should be in office. You have that right, and I think as Christians we should be actively engaged in that process. Here's the one qualifier, though, that you would do that according to the Scriptures in a way that is submissive and obedient to your rulers and show perfect courtesy to all people. And so I, I said there, I'm going to give you four words today. Here's the first two that Paul gives us that relates to this idea right here. And here's your two, the first two words that it means to live the everyday life as a Christian. It's this, respect and kindness. That's what Paul's getting at in the beginning of chapter 3 here. He's talking about that you and I have the ability every day as followers of Jesus to live showing respect and showing kindness to one another. To show respect and kindness to people we agree with. To show respect and kindness, especially to those that we do not agree with. And no, that's not always easy. But it is the calling of those who have been redeemed by Jesus and purified to be God's own possession, zealous or eager for good works. What, what does that look like? It looks like having respect and showing kindness to people in every way that we can. A couple of weeks ago, right before Easter, I was on a, on a conference call with several pastors in our county with some of our local officials and government leaders. And it was right after the official lockdown had come into place and, 
and churches had been included in the essential activities. And there was a lot of talk and speculation that all churches were going to meet as normal or a lot of churches were going to meet as normal and gather as normal on Easter. And, and so some of our leaders got some pastors on a call just to kind of feel us, feel us out what were we thinking and talk through this whole idea. And they didn't say it this way, but here was what they were really worried about. They were worried that most churches were actually going to gather as they normally did on Easter, that actually churches were going to be working against the way that they were trying to help our society instead of working with them. They didn't say it in those words, but that's really, I think, what they were afraid of. And I understood that. And all of us did. And we just kind of reassured them, listen, we're not against you. We are for you. Even if we don't agree with every decision that our our elected officials make, we as the people of God want to be known as a group of people that are for you, that support you, that are helping you and encouraging you in whatever way we can. In other words, we're going to be people that are showing respect and honor to you as our leaders. And again, I could belabor belabor this point for quite a while, and I'm not going to do that, but I just want to encourage you, guys, when it comes to to, to being the church every day, if anybody in this world ought to be people that are characterized by respect and kindness, it should be the people of God, the way that we treat everybody that we get come into contact with. Now he goes on in chapter 3 to list a lot, of more, uh, a lot more ideas and words about what this looks like, but I want you to, to look at verse 14 with me at something else that he says. Paul says, Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. Paul says part of what it looks like to be the church every day in a practical sense is that we would live lives that are not unfruitful. Now what is the opposite of unfruitful? Being fruitful, right? And so here's the the second two words that I want to give you that living the everyday life of the church, what it looks like in practical terms is this. Here's these next two words, helpful and fruitful. Helpful and fruitful. That we would show respect and be kind and that we would be helpful and be fruitful. That's what the everyday church looks like. In fact, Paul says that we should learn to devote ourselves to good works if we're going to be helpful and fruitful. You know, I I, I think most people... When they, the, the way that we live our lives, we want to live lives that matter. We want to live lives that make a difference. I've not met too many people that want to get to the end of their life and, and kind of feel as though they wasted that or didn't do a whole lot of good. Most of us want to make a difference with our lives. But you know, I've, I've found in my own life that no one accidentally spends their life in ways that matter. No one accidentally gets to the end of their life or the end of a season or the end of a year and turns around and looks back and says, man, I did a lot of good this year. I I didn't know I was doing that. No one accidentally makes a difference with their life. The people that are the most fruitful with their lives, that invest their life in things that truly matter, are people that very intentionally devote themselves to being exactly what Paul says here, helpful and fruitful. Now, what does that look like to be helpful and fruitful? Well, it can look a lot of different ways, but I want to share a story with you, Uh, a story of a member of our church who's found a very unique way in this season to be helpful and to be fruitful to some people that she was serving before this social distancing, before all the stay-at-home orders came in place, some ways that she has found to be an encouragement and a help to those that she was already serving. Take a minute and watch this. All right, well, good morning, Sarah. Thank you for joining with us today. Um, Tell us uh, a little bit about yourself as we get started. Absolutely. Good morning. My name is Sarah Salaveria. I am a veteran teacher of 15 years. Um, I teach in Orange County. I teach sixth and seventh grade intensive math students. So that means of our whole school population, I teach the bottom 30% of our students um, in math who are just academically below grade level. So I have Um, Some very challenging students. I have students with disabilities, um, students with language um, learning difficulties, um, just a whole vast range of students. Well, I was impressed recently as I was kind of scrolling through social media and I saw a post that you had made about something that you're doing, regularly making contact, calling your parents and your students, just checking up on them. But one of them in particular just really stood out to you enough that you made a comment about it. conversation with a mom and one of your students. Tell us a little about that. Absolutely. 
Um, as a teacher, we always have like one student who just really grabs our heart. Um, this one student, he is a challenge, um, but he just, he's got me wrapped around his finger. And when I was calling his mom and talking to her, um, she's a young mom, she, um, single mom, she is a manager at a drugstore. And since this whole COVID-19 has come into place, she's been working double shifts because the other manager is out. And um, I was just talking to her about her son's progress and she just started to break down on the phone saying, like, I'm trying my best, but I'm, when I get home from work, he's already sleeping and um, it's just really hard to stay on top of him. And I said, and I'm crying on the phone too. I said, just give me his number and I will make sure that I will keep in contact with him weekly and make sure that um, we get him where he needs to be and that he's getting everything accomplished. So she gave me his number and she said, I'll text you. I'm going to let him know that you're calling first so that he actually answers his phone. And um, so she sent me a message back in about 10 minutes and she says, okay, you can call him now. Um, so when I called him, I was like, hey, how are you? This is Miss Salabri. And he's like, hi. And I was like, how are you doing? How's math going? And he's like, it's okay. And I said, I really miss you. I miss seeing you and miss having you in my class. And his voice started to crack. And he's like, you miss me, Miss Sal? And I was like, yes, I miss you. You're such an encouragement in our class. And I just love your smile and just seeing you every day. And I was like, I, I really, truly miss you. And you could hear the, his voice crack and the tears and we both just had a moment together. And um, I've been calling him every week since just making sure that he's staying on top of his assignments and getting things done. Well, Sarah, I just want to say thank you because it's that kind of heart for people uh, that makes what you do, uh, not only what you do so important, but the way in which you do it. And, you know, we're talking a lot right now as a church about how to be the church every day, not just on Sundays. Um, but every day, no matter what we're doing and uh, the places God has us. And it's, it's moments like that that is exactly what I think God wants us to be in this world. So I just want to say thank you for being that. Thank you for loving those students and investing in them the way that you do. And thank you for taking a moment and being willing to share your story with um, our entire church. Blessings. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, I, I love that story and the way that, Sarah has spent so much of, of time intentionally investing in the life of her students and the way it's moved her in this season. But here's the thing, being able to be helpful and fruitful, it's really not about your, your profession. It doesn't matter what you do for a living, where you're working, if you're working, it doesn't matter the, the types of gifts and abilities and traits that you have, the, the way that God has wired you. Making a difference is simply about being intentional to devote yourself to doing what is good. No one accidentally spends their life in ways that matter. We do that by intentionally deciding, I'm gonna be helpful, I'm gonna be fruitful, I'm gonna be respectful to the people around me, and I'm gonna be kind. Now, I want to, I want to wrap this up today by, by kind of asking this question and spending a minute talking about something. What is the difference between the way the church and the world is called to do good? Or maybe ask it this way, what is the difference in the good that the church does and the good that the world does? Because the fact is, you don't have to be a Christian to do good. You don't have to be a Christian to be fruitful and to make a difference. There are a lot of non-religious, irreligious people who are doing a lot of really good things, especially right now during this COVID-19 uh, situation. There's a lot of organizations that are run by people with, without any spiritual connection at all that are serving and being kind and being helpful and being respectful to all people. So it, given that, what, what is the difference between the good the church is called to do and the good that the world does on a regular basis? I, I would submit to you the difference is this. That when it comes to the church, when it comes to being the church every day and to you and I living our lives as Christ followers, the difference in the church is that we are to be ready, we are to be devoted, and we are to be eager to do good, not just on Sundays, not just on, during holidays, not just during crisis days. We are called to be ready, to be devoted, and to be eager to do good every day. And, and not just moments that are opportunistic, 
not just when the, 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 being in the right place at the right time and having the opportunity to do good to someone, but we would be devoted, we would be eager to spend our lives showing respect to those that we find it difficult to, to maybe like and to agree with, that we would be eager to show courtesy uh, and be kind to people, that we would be eager to be helpful and fruitful. And in this letter in the, in, 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 to Titus, Paul says it this way, that when you and I do that, when we spend our lives every day being the everyday church in the ways that he's described in here, he says, here's the reason why we actually do this. In chapter 2, verse 10, he says this, so that in everything you may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. You see, when you and I are being the everyday church in very practical ways, by showing respect and kindness, by being helpful and fruitful and being devoted to do what is good, eager for, the, for, for those good works, we are making the doctrine of God Attractive. That's what that means. We are adorning the doctrine of God. We are taking the, the character of God, the nature of God, and we are putting that on display for the world to see, and we are making the message of Jesus Christ attractive to a world that desperately needs to know Jesus died for them. And so church, this is something that we can do. And being socially distant or not. This is something we can do, whether we are gathering together in public or not. This is something not only we can do, but we are called to do. And that is to be the church every day. And so here's what I want to ask you this week. I want to ask you to think about ways that you can do this and be this every day. Go for a walk around your neighborhood. You see some neighbors, stop, say hello. Yeah, stay, keep your distance. I get all of that, but say hello. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them if you can pray for them. Ask them if they need anything. Send a note, an encouraging text. Pick up the phone, make a call to someone that you haven't spoken to in a while that you know may need some encouragement today. Find a way to be helpful and fruitful and encouraging, not only today, but every day. Because that's what God has called us to be. Not a church that just gathers once a week but a church that lives out our mission in this world every single day. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the words that Paul wrote to Titus, the way that he encouraged him to lead the people 2,000 years ago and how applicable that is to us today. God, I pray that we would not just be a people that thinks about church in terms of a place that we attend on a weekly basis, but something that we are and that we live out every single day. God, you redeemed us and you purified us. That means that you saved us from our sin, but you also saved us to something. And that is you saved us to be a people that is eager to do good, eager to pursue what is good, eager to be all that is good. And God, my prayer is that we would be that for you every day. We would be a people that loves you, that knows you, and that lives out your mission in this world today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great week. It's good to be reminded of the call that God has placed in each one of us. We have the opportunity to be the church in meaningful ways every single day. Thanks again for joining us at the Church at South Lake Online. Before you leave today, we would be so grateful if you would do a few things for us. First, if this is your first or second time, we would love to know that you joined us. If you wouldn't mind, please fill out our online connection card by clicking the button on the page, or if you're watching on Facebook, it's in the description. Second, stay connected and up to date with all that's happening by following us on Facebook or Instagram at The Church at South Lake. You can also text the word Castle News to 22828 for weekly updates. And as always, visit us at thechurchatsouthlake.com. If you would like to give, we have several ways you can do that. You can do so by clicking our Give button or the link in the description by texting TCastle to 77977. You can mail it in to the address on the screen or by visiting us at thechurchatsouthlake.com slash give. If you would like prayer or want to take the next step towards Jesus, we encourage you to click the prayer button on the screen or if you're on Facebook, the link in the description. We want to remind you that we are praying for you, we love you, and we are for you. We appreciate you joining us and we hope to see you next week at the Church at Southlake online.